All right, so let's talk a little bit about reservoir depletion. So uh, when we deplete a reservoir, we are lowering the pore pressure, right? By extracting fluid, lowering the pore pressure. And when we lower the pore pressure, that changes the effect of stress. So we're, we're changing the effect of stress, which could then, depending on what your goals are, it could help you or could hurt you. It could, one example of where it could help you is through compaction drive. Right? So we talked a little bit about this, I think, earlier in the class, is that if you're lowering the effect of stress, ultimately you can begin to squeeze the pores, right? And it's like, it's like you're squeezing the sponge. And that, 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 that effect of the overburden, squeezing the pores and squeezing the sponge can actually induce more production. So it's, it's kind of an inter interesting concept because it's like you're producing to, to induce more production. Right? Or the, the result of producing for some time induces more production. Right? Now at some point, there's, you know, it's, there's no free lunch. At some point, that's going to go the opposite way because at some point you're going to inelastically close the pores, right? Permanently close them, or you can. It's a possibility, depending on the strength of the rock. Um, you know, inelastically deform and close the pores, and then, of course, now you're reducing your permeability. And hopefully you use your big data model to get your permeability from your porosity of them. Anyway, uh, that's one area where there's a possibility that it could, it could hurt, it could help you in, in the compaction drive. The, the other thing is, though, is, is there can be a lot of negative consequences of reducing the stress, and that is if it induces faulting, right? So if you, um, if you, you know, say you have a lot of horizontal wells in a field, and you're producing, and you have significant enough stress changes that now you're normal, you're you're going into a normal or reverse faulting regime, most likely normal faulting, then you'd be shearing off the horizontal legs. And that wouldn't be a good thing. So it's important to understand a little bit about how depletion uh, affects. And you know, a lot of times, like many of the things we talk about in this class, I mean, the more sophisticated models would be computational. Um, but, but we can do some simple things using analytical models. And uh, this picture here comes from uh, the solution, I think it was done by a guy named Gertzma. Um, but this was an. Um, this is an analytic solution to, stre to the stress field if you have a pressurized reservoir in an infinitely, otherwise infinite half space. Right? So if you have an otherwise infinite body and you have a pressurized reservoir in the center of it, then these are the types of, uh, of stress changes that you can expect through depletion. And so, if you, I don't know if you can see it, but like that's like a negative three right there. So that contour indicates that there's ne negative implies compression, so that that in that um, that indicates a possible three time multiplication uh, of the of the um, horizontal stress field due to depleting this. Right? So uh, by one unit of depletion, you know, one psi of depletion. Uh, could could induce a, you know a factor of three change in the stress at that contour. Right? And we'll we'll revisit this um, we'll revisit this later. Again, this was uh, by a guy named Gertzma. The solution we'll we'll look at that solution later. So. This is essentially was the, the solution on homework three that you had to derive. Um, but basically, if you assume that the horizontal stresses are equal, and, uh, and, and you know a semi-infinite reservoir so that the strains are negligible, then you reduce the equation down to this. This was again the, the derivation is in homework three uh, solution that I posted. And so if you didn't take the derivative of both sides of that equation, right, so if you take the derivative with respect to uh, the pore pressure, then you, then you get this guy. Right? And so then if you simply use a 
dis discrete approximations. So if you if you take the continuous derivative and you discretize it to say that's a change in the horizontal stress uh, over a change in the pore pressure, right? and then you multiply both sides by the change in the pore pressure, you get that guy. And then if you just plug in some realistic numbers uh, for Poisson ratio and BO coefficient. So Poisson ratio, a realistic number, you know, a good guess for Poisson ratio of a rock would be around 0.2 or 0.25. And, uh, you know, if you have an unconsolidated sand, a conventional reservoir, the BO coefficient would be close to 1. If you just plug those numbers in, then you can get that, you know, the change in horizontal stress is 2 thirds the, the change in any um, any reduction in, in pore pressure. So that that's a good estimate. And if you if you then plot that, and I don't I don't know why this why this doesn't show up. There should be I don't know why you can't see, but there should be black lines here. Sort of like like this. If you look at the figure in Zobach's book, there should be some lines like that. I don't know why. Each of them indicating different, um, these lines indicate different Poisson ratios, but in a reasonable range, right? So, you know, the minimum Poisson ratio is zero, and the maximum would be 0.5. Um, and so if you, if you, if you look at, uh, for these lines, which represent reasonable Poisson ratios, and then again, the, the minimum and maximum bounds on BO coefficient will be zero and one. Um, and, 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 and typically, that's it's more like two thirds to one for realistic values. Then, for there's a whole bunch of fields that they took a look at, and they and they looked at they plotted them on this guy. And by the way, uh, Zobak calls that that D, DSH uh, DP he calls that parameter A. Right? So what he said was that when that, and, and it'll, it'll show up in a second where it comes from, but when A is equal to 0.67, it's this line right here. And that anything greater than that is going to induce some normal faulting, right? or likely to induce normal faulting. And again, th these are under these simplified assumptions, but when you <laughs> plot the real data on this on these fields, of these fields, then sure enough, what, what happens is these fields up here, sure, you know, experienced, if you look at case studies of the, the actual data, they did experience uh, normal faulting, whereas these fields that fall in this regime below did not. And two, two of them we're going to take a closer look at. So the Valhalla flank and the Gulf of Mexico field X, uh, we're going to look at some real data from those fields in just a second. Um, so where did that alpha, that A equals 0.67. So um, basically this is, um, for normal faulting, we had this relationship under, remember the, we talked about the critically, in, uh, critically stressed crust? So this idea that the whole crust is under this sort of state of incipient failure. And so that sets maximum bounds on the stress ratio, right, of what the possible stress ratio could be. And so under normal faulting, then what you have is like the, the vertical stress over uh, SH min um, is equal to this quantity. That, the, if, you, if you need a refresher on that, you can go back and look at those videos. We talked about critically stressed earth. But that's where this relationship came from. Okay, and then if you, if you plug in, um, you know, basically the equations for the vertical and minimum stress, taken into account and then considering any change, right, any change in, in uh, pore, pr pore pressure and vertical stress, or basically just plotting this guy, delta, delta. Right. And then you uh, plug in your, your, your numbers again, a reasonable number for, um, or, you know, we, we, we talked about friction, the internal friction, I'm not, not the internal friction, but the fr Friction of two rocks, we just sort of said, is always 0.6, right? Unless you have a reason to believe it's not. So, um, and it's a good approximation. So if you plug in 0.6 for that guy, um, 
then, then you get some simplifications and ultimately it leads to this value, 0.67. So that's where, that's where this, this number came from. That's where this number came from, this A, 0.67. So then there's this idea of reservoir space plots. So basically, if, you, if you're plotting um, S3 versus pore pressure, uh, the horizontal stress, minimum horizontal stress versus pore pressure for a normal faulting <laughs> regime, um, the, the idea is that you, then you draw that line A on this guy. Right? So the, the line A is represented by this guy. And you'll start somewhere in the reservoir, and then whatever rate you deplete the reservoir at, it, it depends on where you, know, where you go along that stress, that in, in this stress space. But if you, if you go in a direction such that your depletion rate is going to intersect this line associated with A, right, uh, the, the 0.67 or whatever, then you're, you're going to induce normal faulting and then just flow along it. Right? Because once you're faulting, you're just going to continue to slip. As you deplete, you're going to continue to fault. Um, otherwise, if you, if you head in a different direction, then you're safe and you won't have any faulting. And so this is the idea um, of reservoir. That's just a, that's, that's an explanation of the reservoir stress plot. Um, but then it, you can look at some real data. So uh, this is that Gulf of Mexico field X. Obviously, this is like some anonymized data. We don't know exactly where it came from. Uh, it went into production in the early 80s, and this is a production data through the early 2000s. So it was like 20 years of production data. And all of the, you know, so there's several wells in there, platforms, right? So like the, the square is pl the platform, uh, and the circles are other, well, other wells sort of in between, and they kind of follow up. So if you look over there, the, the, the circles are plotted as circles on this plot, and the and the platforms are plotted as squares on this plot. But if you follow the, the pore pressure re reduction over time, as well as monitor the, the, the reduction in S3, horizontal stress, over time, then you can lay that onto one of these reservoir stress space plots so that this is the, this is the data. I guess there was no initial data, because um, it says estimated initial. But in, the, in 97, 98, 2001, they did have data for um, S3 and the pore pressure reduction over time. And you can see that you're sort of headed on this slope that's above this critical line. And therefore, in this well, uh, like the data indicated earlier, that there was no faulting. Right? So even though it's a simple model, um, it, it apparently gives you know, some, some good information. Um, that uh, you know, if, as long as your stress path, stress stress path A, is above the critical one, which is roughly 0.67, then you should not induce any faulting. You should be should be okay. Conversely, um, there's some data from this Valhalla Valhalla field, uh, and I don't know why they're not showing up on here, but. Um, Again, there should be like some X's up here. It kinda, if you look at the figure in the book, there's some X's up there like that. And uh, this is an anticline formation, so you probably remember that from your geology class. There's like a crest and a flank. And so the X's are associated with the flank and the, and the, the circles are associated with the crest. Uh, you can see them here, but I don't know why they're not showing up. Anyway, this field, uh, did experience significant normal faulting. You can see that all the circles are on the critical line, right? So at the crest, there was faulting. <clears throat> and this field has had lots of trouble with gas leaks. So there's, there's gas leaking from the faults themselves on the crest and also from damage due in the, in the vertical wells uh, and, and the, and that uh, occurred due to faulting. So. Um, the simple kind of stress space plot does seem to give a, a, a pretty reliable, or if you have some good data, uh, a pretty reliable tool to predict whether you're going to experience faulting due to depletion or not. 